What's up? This is Patrick. Welcome to episode 49 of the Double ETF podcast, everything except the football. I hope you guys are doing great. So today, Mike Drew and Woody Meacham, we have three questions. No regular reviews this time. If you want to drop us a line, you can do so at EETF pod on Twitter or EETF podcast at gmail.com. Thank you. All right. So welcome everyone to episode 49 of the double ETF podcast. So tonight we are doing a, something a little different. We are doing a few questions and a few specific topics as well. One of which might be a very brief discussion. <laughs> so <laughs> we will see how it goes. And tonight I have the pleasure of having Mike Drew. How are you, sir? I'm well, thanks. How are you? Ah, good, good. Welcome back. And uh, we also have Woody Meacham. How are you, sir? I'm doing well, Patrick. How are you? Good, good. Oh, you just told us. I don't need to ask you that. I gotta <laughs> yeah, it hasn't changed. It's like when you call the doctor and they go, how are you doing? I go, if I was doing fine, I wouldn't be calling you. Sorry. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. So, okay, we will do a what we watched later this week. But for now, I had a few specific questions in mind. One of them might betray my age, <laughs> but I wanted to have a conversation with you guys regarding DVD commentaries. So this seems to be a thing of the past now. I mean, I don't buy physical media anymore, but do you guys buy Blu-rays anymore? I've never bought a Blu-ray. Okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> there you go. And I'm older uh, than you and I've never bought a Blu-ray. What about you, Mike? Yeah, I've bought, bought Blu-rays and DVDs, but I don't, I, I think I own two, but that, and it's just like two movies that I love as opposed to, you know, buying stuff because it, I saw it. So no, I don't, now with streaming and, you know, it takes up a lot less uh, space. And if I ever move, it'll be a lot easier. I used to have maybe 200 DVDs at some point. I wanted to try and start a, you know, collection of some sort. And I just lost uh, patience and lost interest, especially when you realize that they they release new editions for no reason at all. So you're never done purchasing the, the same the same movie over and over, you know? Yeah, I I bought a lot of DVDs before YouTube when a lot of like artists, music musicians, and stuff would would release like you know collections of their videos or a concert that I'd never seen and. But now with YouTube, and I, I just don't have any reason to, unfortunately. Yeah, th there's not really any points. Yeah, similar boat that my wife's a librarian. So anything I ever wanted to watch, I just asked her she'd bring it home. And oh, nice. uh, <laughs> we actually had a lot more videotapes. So I'm that old. I'm the videotape guy. And when my daughter was born in 98, we actually watched, I'll never forget, it was Michael with John Travolta on videotape because that's what the hospital had. And then we ended up donating all of our videotapes to that hospital because I knew I could get whatever I wanted. That's the movie where he's an, an angel, right? Yes. Yeah. Not very good. There was some no. good lines. I liked, there was a couple parts I liked. Okay. But not a great film, no. <laughs> so yeah, and eventually I just, you know, gave them all away pretty much. Okay. So I don't want to turn this into a monologue, but I can tell you a, a little bit more about my favorite DVD tracks, commentary tracks. And um, you could see it under different aspects, like some were more informative than others. And I think it worked better for older movies. For example, I watched Citizen Kane for the first time. I must have been like 17 or 18. And uh, I thought it was okay. But a few years later, I uh, listened to the DVD track and it was the commentary track and it was Roger Ebert talking about the technical aspects of the movie. And, you know, this was innovative because they did that and this that way, and it had never been done before. And it gave me an entire new appreciation for that movie. And that was awesome. Honestly, it might be my favorite commentary track. I would say the second, my second favorite was probably, and I don't want to turn this into like art house, uh, artsy fartsy uh, nerd party. <laughs> 
too late. I'll bring it maybe. down when I talk about it. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah. I'll bring it right okay. down. <laughs> okay. But there was a, um, a Kurosawa's film, The Seven Samurai. There was a Criterion DVD, and one of the tracks was from an expert on cinema and Japanese culture as well. And he explained the movie from top to bottom, technical aspects and aspects of Japanese society at the time. And that was, that was amazing. If you can track it down, go right ahead. And maybe my third and last one. No, actually, I have two more. <laughs> the third one would be one of the Fight Club commentary tracks. It was Brad Pitt with Edward Norton and Helena Bonham Carter, but she was recorded separately and that was unfortunate but still you know interesting and it was a good mix of anecdotes about the movie technical stuff and just the deeper message of the movie if you like that was amazing and one of my favorites when it comes to you know banter between the participants was the um, escape from new york commentary with uh, john carpenter and uh, kurt russell they are longtime friends and it was obvious just listening to them. You could just, you know, picture them, you know, having a cold one and just trading stories and laughing at what was going on the, the, the screen and, you know, how the shooting went and all that stuff. I, I'd say that was my, my top four, probably. So which do you prefer, though? Do you prefer the actor-director watch-along or the more educational one like the Ebert and Seven Samurai one? Uh, for older movies, I would prefer more informational and technical stuff. But a watch along, that can be tricky because sometimes you can get stuck with someone just describing what's going on the screen, and that's the worst. I would say that probably the type of movie can make a difference, I'd say. I mean, I don't like giving that answer, but my answer would be it depends, <laughs> basically. <laughs> well, no, but it does, it depends on the type of movie. So that, of course, makes sense. Yeah. So you guys never had the chance or never bothered to explore that uh, side of DVD buying? <laughs> it never struck me to do it. Because I even, like when you mentioned this topic a couple of days ago, I went through and looked for DVDs we had in the house. And just to see if I had any that had a commentary on it so I could sit down and go, oh, of course, my favorite is this documentary about Tiger Stadium. But it didn't have anything. And so... um I don't know. It just missed me because I've been, I've got a, you know, an Xbox, which is a Blu-ray player. So I've got the ability to do it. I just, when I get a movie, I watch it. I don't tend to rewatch the same thing over and over again. And it just never dawned on me to sit down and rewatch it with a commentary. I mean, the closest I've ever really gotten to something like this would be like mystery science theater. Okay. <laughs> it's kind of a commentary, you know, yeah, yeah, and, yeah, or like Doug Benson does like a movie interruption show there's a thing called master pancake down in austin texas where they do these kevin smith the director has done them with a few of the batman movies where he'll he'll watch and give commentary and you can kind of join them so i've done more things like that than the actual produced ones because i've heard of the fight club one that you're talking about and then there's another one that i was i was looking up that like I want to say it was like a Tarantino or somebody like that, but, and he's hammered the entire time he's doing it or something. I don't want to say it's him. Don't sue me, but <laughs> it's stuff like that. I mean, it could be fun. I just would have to be in the right mood to do it. Tarantino would be a good guest for your commentary track for sure. The guy has, as we all know, he's got anecdotes until next week and he's got an insane knowledge of all types of movies. Mike, what about you? The only two that came to my mind were, so one of my favorite movies, if not my favorite movie of all time, is Train Spotting. And I remember there was a special edition that came out in 2003, 2004. I don't remember the exact year. And there was commentary with Danny Boyle and I believe Andrew McDonald, who is the producer. Ewan McGregor might have been there as well. And the only thing that I remember that stuck out about it, um, it was kind of nice in the sense that I remember they talked about some of the bonus scenes, like some mm -hmm. of the things that have been cut, they talked about why it had been cut, what happened and what have you. But the one thing I do really remember was, and I was so excited at the time, was that Irvine Welsh, who wrote the original novel, he had a book out that was kind of dubbed the unofficial sequel to Train Spotting called Porno. Yes. And Porno was a great book. Like I actually, I had read stuff that he had written after Train Spotting, and 
like some of it. Some of it I didn't care for, but I actually really liked porno. And, you know, some of the characters overlap, but it really is a whole brand new story. And it's not related to the drug use of the other ones and what have you. So in this commentary, when this deluxe edition got released, I don't remember one of them said, we've just purchased the rights, the film rights for porno. And I thought, yes, you know, because if there's ever going to be a train spotting sequel, it will be awesome because the story's great. Um, that is not what they did. <laughs> so, <laughs> so whatever, 12, 13 years later, when they released train spotting two, in my opinion, it's a hot piece of garbage. It's just <laughs> it's so, so disappointing, especially when they had this brilliant story in porno, which had these new characters, but, you know, tied in the old guard as as much as they needed. And unfortunately that that's not where they went with the, with the sequel. And, and when I, when I joked that I was going to bring it down, the other one that I actually really liked, and, and I mentioned earlier that a lot of the DVDs I own, and I own a couple dozen were normally music based and being a bit of a kiss nerd. When the kissology series came out three, I think there's three, vo- no four volumes. It was basically Gene and Paul, like you were saying with, um, Kurt Russell and and Carpenter basically sitting there watching stuff and shooting the breeze about it and going, hey, remember this? And, you know, or they would tell these little insights that you're like, oh, I didn't, you know, being, again, being a Kissner, it's like, oh, that's cool. Like, you didn't know. That was really good. And especially when they did it with, like, Kiss Meets the Phantom of the Park, which is, I think, the start of the second Kissology volume, which is hilarious. And it's, like, the, one of the worst films ever. Um but them talking about it and how the initial concept was supposed to be like Star Wars meets Hard Day's Night. And you can imagine it's neither of them. <laughs> that was great. But those are the only two like Woody. I mean, nothing else stands out for me. And I was never a huge collector. It was more about, like I said, it was pre-YouTube where, you know, maybe that you had an artist where you hadn't seen all the videos or they had a video that was released in Europe, but not here in North America. And you were like, OK, great. You know, you finally had a copy of it. But that was really the extent of it for me. I would tend to agree with you regarding Transpotting 2. It was, I mean, I don't think I disliked it as much as you did, but I thought it was, it was still a disappointment because Transpotting is probably in my top, definitely top 20, maybe top 10, one of my favorites as well. And if you've never read Irvine Welsh as well, it's tricky. I have to be honest, the very first book I ever read of his was, I think it was Filth. Because I actually read it, I saw um, Train Spotting before I started kind of go back to read stuff. That was made into a movie as well, right? It was with yes. I can't think of his name. I think another Scottish guy. Was it James McAvoy? That's the one. Okay. Yeah. It was okay. The book is really good. The movie was fine. But Train Spotting, yeah. Again, the film. The film is one of those rare cases for me where the film I think is actually better than the book. And when I read Porno before I had heard about this commentary. I remember thinking this reads like a script. Like this is will be the perfect adaptation if they go with a sequel. And then I heard that I got so excited. And then, yeah, I don't know what happened. Studios, maybe, who know? Yeah, that's possible. I I don't know, honestly. I don't know either. But regarding that topic, it would probably be easy for like uh, Amazon Prime or Netflix to uh, add a couple of audio tracks to put commentaries there. Of course, you know, my plea will will be ignored, <laughs> I'm pretty sure. Well, I'm sure they could do it just by, like, they have all the different channels for different languages. That's all it would have to be. Yeah, exactly. You know, and the same thing with closed caption and all that other stuff. It's it, The technology's there to do it, but but per your point, will they? And I'm sure somebody's screaming at their phone right now, like, they right. do! You don't know Come about this! Yeah. On Hulu, you just go here! <laughs> but, you know, I don't know, yeah. So... Basically, you cannot say that you missed them, either of you. <laughs> right. Yeah, I have no. Yeah. Also, I remember on the some of the DVDs I used to have on the back, like bonus, uh, you know, commentary track and blah, blah, blah. And every time I was like, okay, that sounds interesting. I'll, I'll check it out, uh, you know, when I get around to it. And I never did <laughs> <laughs> for most of them, you know. So that sucked. So yeah, RIP. DVD commentaries, I suppose. <laughs> well, I mean, it's almost like the watch-alongs now, right? I mean, there's people on YouTube who do, and podcasts oh, yeah, who yeah. do watch-alongs. It's like, okay, hit play now. Yeah. 
That's probably the new version of it. Yeah, I'm sure there's probably some out there. I just, I don't go to my All right, that's it. like the, I mentioned the Kevin Smith one with the Batman. Yeah, I forgot the exact URL, but I remember that there was a website with DVD commentaries ripped from the DVD themselves that you could download only the audio track. And there was a shitload of them, hundreds. And I'm guessing that the site got taken down uh, because uh, that's kind of a tactical acquisition material right there. <laughs> okay, so yeah, that covers it for DVD commentaries. That was more than two minutes. So uh, yeah, right. <laughs> we can give ourselves a gold star for this one. The next topic was international TV shows. Let's try and focus on that. Personally, I went with non-US and non-UK. So I don't know what you guys did, but we can start with Woody. What did you have in mind for this? Well, so can I go Canada? Sure. You can. Because that is you, yeah, yeah, exactly. to me. You can. <laughs> you can. Yeah, exactly. Well, I just got quick ones for Canada is I'm a big Letter Kenny and then Shorzy guy. So those Letter Kenny, when I found that show, that just, that came out of nowhere to me about three or four years ago. Or no, it was pre-pandemic, so it was four years ago. That just, that's knocked me off. I know it's, you have to judge everything by that. And then Shorzy, the comedy and the writing and that is just, it's phenomenal. Schitt's Creek, which everybody loves out of Canada, is fantastic. And that was one of those I binged. I didn't watch it and didn't watch it. And then finally, when I binged it, it was right when it was ending. And so it was one of those, the line I told one of my cousins was I like, you got to experience this relationship for four years. I just did it in four weeks. And it really sucked when it ended because I really, really liked it. And then I want to say our good friend, Ronnie Aces, turned me on to Corner Gas. Oh, yeah. So I went yeah. back and watched all of Corner <laughs> Gas, including the animated series and all that stuff. And what a nice, sweet, funny I don't know a lot of Canadian celebrities, but I was able to like pick out when I think it was tragically hip was in his garage, you know, stuff like that where I'm like, Oh, I actually know who those guys are. So that was good. So those are my Canada ones. I'll put those over to the side now. The other ones that I've, so can't use UK. So no, no, you can, I didn't, but you can. Oh, you limit. Okay. Sorry. Cause I'm a doctor who guy, but I'm a 2005 on doctor who guy. So I'm a Chris Eccleston up. Tom Baker and all that stuff was on when I was a kid. I just couldn't get into it. But when the Eccleston stuff came out, that stuff grabbed me and uh, it was amazing. And then more recently, there's a show called Ragnarok that is out of, I think, Finland or Norway or Sweden. Yep. I can never remember which one. It's not Finland, but it's Norway or Sweden. I think it's Norway, but uh, let me yeah. look it up. But it's the, uh, it's a story of two kids and their mom move back to a town and they gradually find out that the the main character and his brother are Thor and Loki. And it's the way they play it out. There's two seasons of it. A third one's coming out, I think, very soon. I really liked it. And then the only other one I want to throw in that I've tried, and I was going to throw it out to you guys, is The Dark out of Germany. Yep. Or Dark. It's Dark. Dark. Yes. Yes. Dark. I tried tried to get into that one, but I couldn't. Uh, sorry, yep. Ragnarok is Norwegian and it's on Netflix in the US. And uh, yeah, Dark uh, from Germany. Yep. Go uh, go ahead. It was one that was highly recommended to me, but I didn't, I couldn't get into it. So I didn't know if maybe it was on one of your guys' list. Not me. And I've heard good things about it as well. But what I've heard was it got a little too complicated with the time jumps. And I don't think I would have the patience for that, to be honest. <laughs> and that makes me a terrible uh, audience uh, member, I guess. But uh. My question is, are you watching these with subtitles or dubbed? Um, the Ragnarok is dubbed. Oh. Um, okay. Dark was subtitled. I was watching subtitled. Oh, and then, of course, I'm missing the obvious ones of Squid Games, which was a lot of the Squid Games. Kingdom, which is another one that's out of South Korea, were also fantastic. And then, while this doesn't count, I've been getting into a lot of anime because my son is. And a lot of that is either dubbed or subtitled. And again, it's just, it's something we kind of bond over. And it's amazing now, the people in their 20s to 30s that know all of this anime stuff. And I can literally walk into a place and see somebody who's 30 and go, 
what anime are you watching right now? And they'll go, what? And they'll, they'll tell, they'll, they're going like, oh, oh yeah, we just uh, finished up Attack on Titan, you know, the other night and the new series is coming out. And they're like, how do you know that? And I'm like, cause my son watches it and I'm, I like it too. So there's too many of those to name, but there's, that would be like its own category is just anime. So those are some of the stuff I've been watching recently. Although the stuff I have been more for this show has been more of the American stuff. All right. Regarding anime, I remember the first anime I watched was uh, Ninja Scroll from 1993, I think. And another anime classic, it's Akira from yep. 2000, I think. Yep. We are getting to the point that parents can tell their children about the anime they watched, you know? <laughs> well, see, and I'm, a, I'm an anime guy from like the 70s. So like I had, like I told my son, I'm like, have you ever seen Battle for the Planets or Star Blazers? And he's like, what are you talking about? And so there's Crunchyroll and, uh, oh, I'm going to blank it, Hive or something like that. Crunchyroll is where most of the really, really good stuff is. Um, it's a subscription service that just has everything on it. Otherwise, I've been finding like online clips and stuff and showing it to them. And it's so bad. The stuff I watched when I was a kid compared to how it is now. But right to your point, there's like, I made him watch Akira. Mm. He wouldn't watch it and wouldn't watch it. I'm like, dude, like so much of the stuff you watch is based off of this. Yeah. I mean, I remember Japanese cartoons when I was a, when I was a kid, but for some reason, technically it was anime, but I don't think of it as anime. Was Astro Boy anime? Yes, it is considered that. Is it? Okay. I wondered. Actually, that's a good question. What makes Japanese cartoons from our youth? Technically, it is anime, but why don't we think of it as, as such? For me, the term anime is new-ish to the culture. I would, like, right, when I was a kid, it was a cartoon. Yep. But because now that it's been saying, oh, it's out of Japan, then it's anime, because normally, I don't know if it's normally or not, my son was explaining this to me, is like a lot of anime is based on manga, which is the written version. Okay. And so he, he would normally just say anime is based off of manga, I go, but it does have to be. He goes, well, no, not really. But I'm like, okay, well, then there's no rule. But... um. I basically just think it's anything that's coming out of Japan is considered anime. Okay. I think there's a, an aesthetic to it as well. A lot of times is, and I, I'm not that well versed in it, but I know when I have kids asking me at work for manga books, I certainly see a lot of a similarity of the art between them. So, but it's funny you say this because I brought this up at the dinner table tonight and I was, you know, I wanted to make sure I wasn't forgetting anything when it came to me. And the first thing, my son, who I think is younger, obviously younger than yours, Woody, but he's like, Pokemon. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> so I told yep. him I'd bring it up. So there it is. Nice. Well, yeah. And that's my, that's actually how my son got into it all was Pokemon, like the video game back in the day on the Game Boy. And because of that, then he found out there was a show. And then he found out from that show, he found other shows. And so that was his entry into it as well. And that was, again, where I used to have a lot of inroads with kids because I could talk Pokemon with them. Yeah. Oh, good. Good. Okay, so that's uh, that's it for your list, uh, Woody? Yep. Okay, all right. Mike, what do you have in mind? I know it's like, back up, Mike's got a list. <laughs> Boy, okay. <laughs> listen, strap in, people. Because, <laughs> no, listen, I won't be, I won't take forever, but I do have a bunch of honorable mentions, which I will just briefly mention. Go ahead, absolutely. Okay, so I, as we probably know by now, I do watch a lot of UK, Australian. And I wouldn't consider Canadian titles as foreign because obviously i'm in canada and, and you know patrick you and i are here but i think i kind of went anything that wasn't american that's how i kind of looked at it um just because they're so dominant obviously so woody i actually had quarter gas on mine as well it's the one canadian title i put down um not to say that kim's convenience and other titles aren't great but my favorite of all of them is is easily corner gas um peter k who's a british comedian has had some brilliant comedy series. He had one called Car Share. He had one called Phoenix Nights. Um, he's one of my favorite stand-ups as well. I love those shows. There's some Australian dramas I'll just mention quickly. Underbelly, if you've never seen Underbelly. I saw that and it was great. Yeah, so there's various series. There's one that's based on the Golden Mile, which is kind of like the, the nightclubs in Sydney back in the 80s and into the 90s. That series was brilliant. There's a series that's based on a on a crime family that kind of started in the 70s. Uh, they're all based on true stories. How true the actual results are, who knows? But 
those shows are great. There's some later series. They became a little, I don't know. I kind of lost it at that point. Do you know how many series there are total? I've seen three. I think there's four or five, but then there was a bunch of one-off specials. Uh, okay. And I think they actually did one recently. They did one in huh? maybe before COVID, and it's a more modern one. Okay. Because I think the third series was in the 1920s. That's right. And that's where I started to kind of wane. Yeah. It was all right, but it wasn't as good as the as the first yeah, two. The first two were brilliant. There's actually a kind of, there was an Australia, or sorry, a Kiwi New Zealand crime, not that it was based on reality, but it was called Outrageous Fortune. I wasn't a huge fan of that show that was on in the early 2000s, but up until about two years ago, so I think there was four or five series, there was a, a pre-show for Outrageous Fortune called West Side. Okay. And if you, I think it's on Tubi in Canada, it's, it's, I think it's free to watch. And it is really well done, especially like the first three or four seasons. And like British and Australian shows, I think they're eight to ten episodes a, a season. Um, so they, they were really good. Just looking at my list here. There was actually a, an Australian family drama. Uh, I wouldn't say it was four families, but about a family called Pack to the Rafters. And Prime brought out a... It ended a few years ago. ended about seven or eight years ago in Australia. And then Prime brought out a newer version with the same cast, basically, I think two years ago. And it was okay, but I definitely, the original series was, I really liked. Rev is a great British comedy. If you've never seen it, the main actor's name is escaping me right now. Olivia Coleman plays his wife. And it's about a, a reverend who has, ends up in this huge church in London. And the congregation is just this cast of characters, but it was brilliant. Um, and call my agent. I'll go with that one as well. Tom Hollander. Tom Hollander. That's yeah. right. Brilliant. If you've never seen it, it's worth watching. I think there was two seasons. He's this reverend who's conflicted at times with like his relationship with God and wanting to be the best person he can be and help people, but not all the people in his parish make it easy. <laughs> and it's really well done. I think it's kind of a detectorist type show. If you like detectorists... Huh? I think Rev isn't a far isn't a far stretch from there. Those are my just like my mentions. <laughs> okay, that's on the Apple TV in the US. Oh, okay, great, worth checking out. Yeah, it might be on BritBox up here or something like that. I don't know. I can check quickly. Okay, my list <laughs> in no particular <laughs> order. Well, I'll save my favorite to the. I have one favorite. This very last. Sorry. Uh, BritBox, yes, and you can buy it on Apple TV as well. And Google Play and whatever, but the streaming, it's in Canada, Bridbox. Yeah, and it's it's just a sweet show. Again, very similar. Not the same story as Detective, but I think if you like one, you'll like the other. Okay, my top five. I'll leave number one, but two to four, or sorry, two to five is just any order you want. Um, in the UK, there is a music quiz show. It's actually on still right now because they brought it back a few years ago on Sky but it used to be a BBC show. It's called Nevermind the Buzzcocks. There's been various hosts, Bill Bailey, who's another British comedian, Noel Felding. Is that right? I could be wrong. They were like the, the team captains and there would be all these musicians and celebrities and stuff that would come on and do this pop rock quiz. It was sweetly, it was a lot of fun, especially for music geeks like myself. And there's actually an, a British, or sorry, there's actually an Australian, so I'm kind of making my list six, equivalent that's called Spicks and Specs, which is hosted by Adam Hills, who's an Australian comedian who does a lot of stuff in Britain. Both a lot of fun if you're a music geek. And there's a lot of clips and a lot of episodes on YouTube if you're interested. There's an Australian comedy that's coming back this year. I'm so excited. It's called Utopia. It's also known as Dreamland. And it's, it's about a fictitious government agency in Australia called the Nation Building Agency, I think it's NBA or something. And basically it was set up so it looked like the government was doing something. And they're in charge of like infrastructure and, and it's basically the relationship between uh, Canberra, which is the federal government, and what's actually happening on the ground. And it's hilarious because just some of the nonsense you have, don't realize I'm sure that happens in politics. In Canada, a few years ago, we had a Canadian comedian called, named Rick Mercer, 
Mm-hmm. And he did a lot of like political, but it wasn't it wasn't a sitcom, but it was just like he would go and interview or he would go to some place and, and, and talk to politicians. And it was funny. It was it was lighthearted. I think if you appreciate it, if you're Canadian, and you appreciated that. I think you'll appreciate Utopia. And there's a new season coming out after like five years. So this is we're all I'm very excited about that. OK. And also, you probably saw me react when you mentioned Utopia. I saw a show called Utopia, but it was a different show from 2013. I don't know if you remember that one. The no. synopsis is the Utopia Experiments is a legendary graphic novel shrouded in mystery. When a group of strangers find themselves in possession of an original manuscript, their lives suddenly and brutally implode. And it was two seasons, I think. And it was amazing. Okay. Well, this one, I think, like I said, when it was on Netflix here, it was called Dreamland. And that may have been why. Maybe there was a conflict between the titles. That would be a good reason because uh, yeah, the one you're talking about, I've never seen. I have to tell you, one of my favorite parts of one of the episodes was uh, the guy who runs the office comes in one day and he's about to go make himself a coffee before he starts work. And he walks over and he sees there's this new coffee machine and his PA comes running up to him and she's like, what are you doing? And he's like, I'm going to make a coffee. And she's like, have you been trained on this? And he's like, no, <laughs> it's, just, it's just like the nonsense that you have to deal with in the public sector. Right. Um, I will also say I'm looking at my thing. So I'm also going to go with another British comedy. A lot of people will be surprised by this choice. It was just, it landed at the right time for me. Uh, the Inbetweeners, which is... Love that. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> so The Inbetweeners, just uh, four friends, goes from private school to like a public school in the UK, ends up meeting three other kind of the outcasts of uh, of the school, like, you know, and they're in high school, whatever. And they actually made an American series, which was not very good for, I think, one season. But it's very crude. And I'm not normally a crude person, but I think it's just got this British charm to it. And it's just, you know, I think we've all, I think most of us anyway, have, you know, remember trying to talk to girls and, failing. you know, or, or someone you <laughs> fancy. Yeah. And failing miserably or like, you know, just you have that one friend who's an idiot. And, you know, it's just all that, those uh, relationships. And I love it. There's two movies as well. The first one, they go to Ibiza. It's pretty good. The second one, they go to Australia. It's not as good. It's just cool because it's set in Australia. Um, but the show, brilliant. I loved it. And Hold on. Before you move off of that one, though, hopefully this isn't on your list, but did you see Dairy Girls then? I love Dairy Girls. Dairy Girls could have easily been on my list as well. Okay. Yeah, Right. That's the female version of Inbetweeners, I always thought. Yeah, I would actually say it's that's classier. For lack of a not better as word, crude, right? Not as crude, not, <laughs> not as, as crude. crude. There, I mean, they have that one friend that's like boy crazy, and she brings everything down. <laughs> but right. I, I can't think of it. like the the one that had the earrings. That's that's how I I can't remember. But yeah, the Dairy Girls is fantastic, and if you've never seen it, it's, it's amazing as well. Which leaves me, I believe, my two favorite shows, and and two of my favorite shows of all time, actually, probably arguably my favorite comedy, just tied with WKRP. Um, is Only Fools and Horses, which is a, a British show with Jason, David Jason, and oh, wait, I'm so bad with names. Um, who played his brother? Anyway, it's a wonderful family kind of uh, set in Peckham, which is like a suburb of London, not necessarily the nicest section of London, but he's a bit, they're a bit dodgy. They wheel and deal like to kind of stay alive. And it's really fun and very heartwarming and i'm all about that a lot of great lines a lot of great relationships between family members friends um and it's it's long done i think they had a special in the early 2000s but i think the show actually ended in the early 90s or the mid 90s but brilliant i think some of the comedy and it's timeless and actually i'm going outside of the uk and outside of australia and outside of new zealand <laughs> for my final yeah so i'm gonna go a little international Probably my favorite drama of all time, and I have mentioned it on here before, is The Bridge. So it's a Danish Nordic drama. The first episode, there's a body found on the bridge that separates Denmark and Sweden, and a cop from Denmark and a cop from Sweden have to solve it together. You know, we all know from other cop shows that other forces don't like each other, you know, <laughs> other divisions, and we can't work with the feds on this one, you know, they'll hold stuff from us or whatever. 
brilliant. The main character, I believe she's the Swede uh, Saga. She's, you know, the theory is that she's has Asperger's and it's just the way it's written. It's just so beautiful. And I mean, for a murder, you know, over a murder, it's unbelievable. And it's probably, in my opinion, the greatest drama of the last 20 years. But, you know, I'm sure I'm forgetting something as well, but that's the one I always think about. So it's really good. I saw it as well. There were four seasons total. Yeah. It's from 2011 in the US. You can stream it on something called Topic. Okay. I don't know what that is. I have no idea what that is, and I live here now. <laughs> on Plex as well, two seasons, and you can buy it on Amazon. And there was an American remake. Uh, I never watched it. Same. But no interest? No. Like, you know, unless you really don't like subtitles, <laughs> you have no reason to, uh, to watch the remake of that, you know? Well, I mean, there was an Australian, one of the shows I probably mentioned this before, there was a great Australian dramedy called Rake, and they made an American version. Fox picked it up and made a network version with Greg Kinnear. And that was actually okay. It wasn't great, like in the sense that I had seen the Australian one on first. I wonder if I had seen the American one before I'd seen the Australian one, if I'd liked the because Greg Kinnear is good in it. And the, you know, some of the, the plots kind of overlap. But overall, it was a similar show, but different. Uh, the bridge, yeah, I don't, I would not want to spoil it, and I'm not saying the American one would, but the Danish one is so great. Rake, the original version, that's the one with um, Richard Rocks. Oh, Richard Roxburgh, yeah, yeah, Bar Roxburgh, Barry, 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 yes. yeah, or Burrow or something. He was in Mission Impossible too. <laughs> yes, yeah, and he's fantastic. This lovable rogue, and that's a great show as well. If you've never seen it, might have been on Netflix at some point. I think that's where I saw it. And uh, the bridge in Canada, that seems to be difficult to find as well. So, uh, unfortunately. What's your term? Tactically acquired? Yes. Yeah, you're going to need uh, some tactical acquisitions for this. All right. My turn, I guess. Okay. So, no UK, no Canada, no US, no Australia. That's it. Is this? No, I was going to say continental Europe, but not even that. So, let's give it a, give it a whirl. I don't know if it qualifies. I think it was a, a co-production, but... Uh, up there, I don't have a clear order, but I got to say Narcos. Here it says from uh, Colombia. So I know the product was from Colombia, but I don't know if the TV series was. <laughs> so, you know, let's, uh, let's leave that in the air. Number two would be, okay, I'm biased, but Babylon Berlin from Germany. You, I don't know if you guys have heard of this. It takes place in the late 1920s in Berlin. So everyone is struggling. It's it, like the big depression hasn't hit yet, but it's like maybe 1926 or something. So there, there is still the aftermath of the First World War. And uh, you have a um, homicide detective with massive PTSD from the war. And uh, I think at the time, it was the most expensive German TV series ever made. And it shows. You see the money on the screen. You, you have a few scenes that are really crazy. And, you know, you have the you know, like cars from the era, costumes and, you know, all that. I thought it was excellent. Season four was released a few months ago. And I don't know if he is still involved. But at the beginning, one of the creators or co-creators was Tom Tigva. He did Run, Lola, Run. Mm -hmm those uh, a few years ago and uh, yeah it's awesome and in canada it's on netflix probably in in the us as well so babylon berlin check it out it's uh, it's amazing is it a netflix show or was it a show that was picked up by netflix yeah it was picked up by netflix because i think it was uh, shown on the ard public tv in uh, germany first and then it appeared on netflix a few months a few months later okay so i have the bridge on my list as well so there you go. I would say number four, Gomorra from Italy. You probably heard of this. It shows the drug trade in Naples. And I've never been to Naples, but judging from that show, I think I would rather be in prison because they <laughs> make that city look like an absolute dump. It's, it's insane. <laughs> so, so yeah, there you go. The series ended 
last year, I think five seasons total. It's really good. I mean, it's really grim in five seasons. Five seasons, I don't remember anyone ever cracking a smile. <laughs> so that gives you an idea. It's super bleak, but uh, it's awesome. And it's it's um, inspired by a book from an Italian journalist, uh, Rob- Roberto Saviano, who wrote a book about the you know mafia in Naples. And he had to go into hiding because everybody wanted him dead, basically. And I think he is still, you know, uh, under witness protection. And that was like maybe 10 years ago or something. So, uh, yeah, go check it out. In the US, you can stream it on HBO Max, all five seasons. It's honestly excellent. And uh, do you guys have any um, honorable mentions that maybe uh, slipped your mind or you're good for that topic or? Well, I love that you threw in the in-betweeners. I forgot it. So good on. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot. I listen. I, I left. I mean, I left out the IT crowd. I left out in the long run with Idris Albus. It's a fun show. Him and Bill Bailey. One of my favorite sitcoms is a, a Scottish show with two comedians who age themselves called Still Game. That's on Netflix here in Canada. If you're not versed in thick Glaswegian accents, you might want to have subtitles on. Um, there was a great UK detective show a couple of years ago called No Offense. I think it was a Channel 4 show. And if you know Channel 4 in the UK, they're the ones that tend to try things that are maybe a little offbeat. And this was a little offbeat, but it was it was a lot of fun as well. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I could go on forever with UK stuff. but And Cradle to the Grave, which was... There was a BBC presenter named Danny. Oh, why am I forgetting his last name? Anyway, uh, it's based on his life growing up in the 70s. And they only made one season of it. Um, and it was spo- there was supposed to be a second season. And it's brilliant. It's one of the few kind of period comedies that, I mean, that's a kind of a rare thing anyway. But it was really well done. And, you know, the music's fantastic. The soundtrack to it just goes hand in hand. But... Yeah, I mean, I I could probably keep going on and on and on, but I'll stop. So, <laughs> Woody, uh, sorry, uh, were you going to say something? I things kept coming to mind while while Mike was talking that I don't, you know, because you, you've got any, and again, a lot of them are UK based. I was trying to come up with stuff that wasn't in the UK. I know I've dropped this before to you guys, but Alice in Borderlands, which is a Japanese show, is fantastic. Because of that, um, I was also trying to steer away from Australia as well, but you know, I'm I think we're good on this one. <laughs> well, I mean, you don't you don't have to like hey, if you have something brilliant come up. If it happens to be from the UK, that's okay. <laughs> All right, can edit it in later. <laughs> okay. I wanted to ask you, Mike. Have you seen the thick of it from Armando Yanucci, the guy who created Veep afterwards? Yeah, it sounds familiar. You know what? It gets to the point now where it's there's so much, and I'm like, I think I have, but you'd have to give me a synopsis. I can't. Oh, I mean, it's uh, a few years old already, but there is a Peter Capaldi in it. He is a uh, Malcolm Tucker and all uh, Tom, Tom Hollander is in it as well for a few episodes. Oh, yes. Yes, I did. Okay. Yeah. yeah it's good. I think they do those political, I don't want to say satire, but political comedies well, right? It's almost like utopia in a, in, or okay. dreamland in a sense, like there's a bit of an overlap there. So and I actually if I had included American stuff in on my list I think honestly the first few seasons of House of Cards were brilliant. I loved the first season. Second season I started to kind of go uh and then by the third I was out. Yeah, same same Mike. I think he becomes president at the end of the second. Yeah. And as soon as that happens... Where do you go from there? Yeah, exactly. It became yeah. way, way less uh, interesting. Well, I mean, I think it was the second season that starts with the, the train, right? No, that's in the first. I'm pretty Is sure that that's at the end the of the first? first. It's near the end of the first, though, right? Yeah. I don't remember. Yeah, I can't remember. I, I couldn't remember if it was the second started with that or the first end with it. And I kind of thought, I'm not sure about that. But, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, yeah, the second series, it was okay. But the third series, I, I tuned out. I don't even think I watched more than one or two episodes. Yeah, I bailed uh, afterwards. 
All right. So, okay. So that, uh, that covers the uh, international uh, TV series. We have time. One more question. Yeah. You guys are good? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So, okay. The next question was your favorite opening credits. There has to be a few that jump right into your mind. We can start with Woody. Yeah. So mine happens to be one of, well, most of them actually were like my top favorite shows, which I thought was kind of interesting. Sorry. Uh, Could be both movies or TV shows. You know, if you have a top five, you can mix it up as much as you want. Yeah. I went to more, I went, I'm sorry, the TV shows were more memorable to me. That was the part. Cause I, I did think through movies and, um, I don't know. It was just the it was just the TV shows that came to mind because you said opening credits, and so that's kind of what I was thinking of. And right off the bat, I'm gonna, my number one is Northern Exposure. Um, is just because I loved the show so much, and it was just it was so weird. I mean, the music was just this quirky, you know, countryish style song, and then you've just got a giant moose walking down an ab you know an abandoned street, and you know the first five series of it are some of my favorite ever. You know, once um, Paul Provenza comes on, the show kind of goes down, but it's literally, I had my wife, again, because my wife can get anything. Um, <laughs> she got me the first five series on DVD to watch, you know, and I just checked it out and watched it. And I never skipped the opening, even though, you know, there's there's no words, there's nothing. It's just, it just, the show always put me in such a good mood that that just, the reaction to it was just something that was just like it calmed me right away because i knew it was going to be a good fun stupid wacky show and so i loved that one so that's my number one um number two is mash so suicide is painless all the clips of everybody running in that's more a nostalgia one for me because that was one back in the day when it was on I could watch, there was on Mondays, I could watch MASH six times a day <laughs> because it was on reruns. There was two reruns before primetime started, or sorry, three reruns before primetime started, then the actual show itself. So maybe it was five and then two after primetime. Wow. Just based on different, and this was broadcast. This wasn't cable. So I'm talking like early or late seventies, early eighties. And that was just a show like my brother and I would watch together and our family would watch together. So that one and just in the song, Suicide is Painless, you know, as a little kid going, what does that mean? And, oh, it's so trippy. And then you find out that the creator's son wrote the words and they were just nonsense words. He didn't, he just, they need, they had the song and they just said, well, we need lyrics. And so this guy was like, okay, I'll write the lyrics. And so Suicide is Painless comes from nowhere. It's just some goofy thing. Wow. Okay. So there was that one. And then of course the obvious one is cheers. That one is just, again, it's the nostalgia. It's the, the old timey look of the opening credits with all the old kind of hand drawings and the song, the song is just killer. So those are kind of the big ones. But then I started going down the rabbit hole of, of just songs that, that how shows, this isn't a hot take or anything, but just, you don't have those shows that have opening credits anymore. Or if they do, it's so easy to just hit the skip button now on so many things that you watch, you know, that that somebody can put a ton of work into it, but it's like me. But they were so much. And plus, now that you got to cut it down to 22 minutes for commercials, they're not going to spend that time on an opening credit. So those were my top three that I came up with. Okay. Do you have any from movies? <sighs> um, see, the problem, I couldn't come up with any good ones that really struck me from an opening credit sequence. Come back to me on that one. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no problem. Because I tried to think of movies. I just couldn't come up with any good one. Okay. Because uh, I looked for a couple of lists just to, you know, uh, rattle my brain a little bit. And I think I might have a few good uh, recommendations in there. Okay. Great. All right. So, Mike, what do you have for us? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, WKRP is one of my favorite shows of all time, uh, that opening song. And, you know, the credits slightly change. As the seasons went on, at the very in the pilot, it starts with somebody tuning the radio uh, in the car, and changes and shows like the landscape of Cincinnati, uh, a city I've never been to. But and that theme song is 
it's so much better than the downtown of Cincinnati. There you go. I'll take your word for that. <laughs> I spent six months there. Never mm. again. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, the Flintstones. Oh, yeah. Okay. I don't think there's a cartoon where the opening, like you said, Woody, I mean, I've seen every episode at least five times, you know, in my life. In Toronto, growing up, if you went home for lunch from school, that was on. Uh, and you'd watch it and you'd have your lunch. And I think anybody who kind of grew up in the 80s, late 70s, 80s, probably was in a similar boat to me. It was either that or Leave it to Beaver. And I'm not a huge Leave it to Beaver fan. It's okay, but the Flintstones for sure. And I'll stick with cartoons would be The Simpsons. Um, you know, what's Bart writing on the board? You know, how much does Maggie cost? All these things, right? So I'll go with that. Uh, I'll say The American Office. Not because so much of the theme song, but every opening, that's that cold opening of, you know, Jim trying to pull a stunt on Dwight or what have you. And then going into that very short theme, you know, where it's real, it's like quick cuts of all the characters. Um, I'm going to go Phoenix Nights, which is a UK show. Literally, it's about two bars of chimes. That's it. And, you know, it starts again with an opening scene of some sort. And then you hear that. Dun, 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 dun. And anybody who knows the show knows what I'm doing. It lasts for 10 seconds. And it's literally just somebody on like chime. I'm sure it's done on, you know, on the computer. But that being said, you hear it, you know what it is. And I think that's the way to go for me. And being Canadian, come on, if it's not Hockey Night in Canada on a Saturday, Yep. That theme song is Absolutely. iconic in this country, <laughs> right? I mean, yes. you don't even have to be a, a hockey fan and you know exactly what it is. So, and I love some of the montages they've done over the years where it's like the old calls from the 50s, 60s, what have you. It's not always modern. I love that when they kind of show that history piece. Mm -hmm. They don't always do that, but, you know, there have been times where they do. And, and I think that's brilliant as well. So, yep. I couldn't agree more. I got my movie one. Oh, okay. I remembered my movie one, <laughs> A Pink Panther. Oh, All of yeah, the yeah. Pink Panther movies, um, because they were the animated cartoon, I knew the cartoon before I knew of Clouseau movies, you know, the Peter Sellers movies. So when they would have those at the beginning as a kid, because they would show them on like ABC Sunday Night Movie and stuff like that, that was just always like, oh, I know that as a cornerstone, something of going brought my worlds together that I just thought was fantastic. I knew I had one and I just couldn't remember. That's a great shout. Yeah, as soon yeah, as you is. say it, you like Patrick and I's face was like, <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Yes, absolutely. It's easy to go with the super iconic, for example, like Friends or The Sopranos or, for example, but I try to stay away from that a little bit to relative success maybe, but let's see how it goes. I'd say maybe an honorable mention, True Detective season one. It was the best series of the three uh, with by far the best opening credits as well. Uh, what else? I only watched this, the first season, but opening credits for Westworld were super impressive, I thought. But I bailed after the first uh, season, so you know I don't know what happened. Yeah, I did too, but I agree with you. The the way that, that the, it morphed the, the being together from all the different liquids and solids and stuff, I totally with you. And it was so creepy at, at the same time. It, it yeah. was really weird. But I think when it comes to TV, my favorite would be Mad Men. Yep. I would never skip that intro because I thought every time it's not too long. To me, that's very important, but perfection. Uh, what else? Oh, of course. Speaking of iconic Game of Thrones, you know, they would change the opening oh, credits depending on where the action took place. And then I liked what they did with House of Dragon because House of Dragon built off of what they did in Game of Thrones. Yes. Not as not as good, but I thought it was a good homage to what the first thing did. Yeah, it was a good idea to stay in the same type of uh, visuals. Yeah, that's true. Can I add one that I don't like? Yeah, please. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> and this is this is the reference to the show because every episode where you have us on, this show comes up and it's a brilliant show. I do not like the opening song to Slow Horses. <laughs> that Mick Jagger song <laughs> is god awful. I'm sorry. Thank goodness that Apple TV goes, Hey, do you want to skip this? Yes, yes I do. I do. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> oh brutal. You know that 
that might prove your point because, I mean, as much as I love the show, I don't remember the opening credits at all. I, it's the song. I can't listen. It's Mick Jagger, right? He's iconic. He has nothing to prove to me or anyone else. But that song is dreadful. And I can't. It is like 45 seconds long, I think. Maybe it just feels that long. Maybe it's 10 seconds and I just hate it. <laughs> but I just go, it, it's like a little skip thing comes. Yes, I do. Get get rid of it. So, but I love the show. And obviously there's our reference today. <laughs> yep. Awesome. Well, see, and I didn't know if you guys, so, because to me, the 70s was the, to me, the hallmark of when a lot of these really, really cool ones came out. Because did you guys ever see $6 million Man? Yes. Well, yeah, yeah course okay the we can you know mm -hmm. steve austin a man barely alive. i mean those weren't credits those were like nuggets within of themselves and wonder woman that song for the linda carter was fantastic the 18 granted this is late a team. team exactly so much of that stuff was was so iconic back in the day and they just don't do that anymore back in my day they had good <laughs> openings to... well i'm just looking at yeah there's no clouds to yell at sorry i'm looking it's nighttime here now right yes, exactly <laughs> So, okay, so I have a few opening credits for movies. Maybe that will, uh, you know, jog your memory. One that was awesome, Seven, mm -hmm. with uh, Nine Inch Nails. I don't remember that. That was my wife and our second date. Oh, wow. Right. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah. Jesus. Yeah. Okay. I wanted to, like, hold hands and stuff afterwards, and I was like, get off of me. <laughs> She's like, I brought you a present. You're like, I don't know boxes. Yeah, no. <laughs> Uh, another one, Fight Club, great opening credits. What else? Watchmen. Oh, yes. With the uh, times they are changing? Yes. Yeah. And the theatrical cut of that movie was, eh, but the director's cut was excellent. Uh, what else? What else? We could probably like put them all in one same file, but Casino Royale in uh, 2006, the first Daniel Craig movie, the opening credits were just similar enough to the other Bond movies, but still quite unique that to me, they, they stand out. It's the only movie I thought of, uh, the only and franchise, I guess, was Bond. And I'll make the connection to what you said, Woody, about the Doctor Who, right? When the Eccleston series started again in 2005, the opening, just it was just familiar enough, but it was more obviously more modern at the time. And absolutely, Casino Royale, I think they, that's a, now that you say that, I remember that whole opening and it's, yeah, that's really well done. Yeah. See, I skipped over all of the Bond ones because they, to me, I like them all. No, it wasn't, you know, that I was trying to come up with singular examples. Um, for your eyes only, I just happened to watch the other day and that one, they weren't anticipating high resolution. Let me put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah. see a lot more in that opening now than you could back in the day. Okay, I just I, I don't want to turn it into like a dirty old man <laughs> talking, but <laughs> <laughs> Sheena Easton was easy on the eyes as well. Gotta say. Yeah. Gotta say. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh yeah, okay. And my last, I mean I have a bunch, but I'll keep it short. We talked about Guy Ritchie on the last um, episode. I rewatched Snatch. Oh. And the opening credits are awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I just had to mention that. Okay, so um, I guess that's it. Did you guys have any other, you know, titles coming to mind? Or I think the iconic ones, I mean, like in the UK, Match of the Day, the song. Yes. You know, but that's kind of the equivalent to the Hockey Night in Canada theme, you know, for us. Um, and, you know, like, I hate to say bumpers, but like even Sports Center on ESPN in the States, you hear that and you know immediately what's happening. I don't necessarily know if it's a great opening. It's just that a lot of times for me, the connection is the audio, like is the song or the, the jingle or what have you. So things like that, that as soon as you hear it, it's iconic enough that you go, it's this or that. It's kind of usually what wins me over. When you think about it, it doesn't even need to be good. It just has to be no. recognizable and mm -hmm. uh, easy to remember. You know, absolutely. So there you go. All right. So yeah, that's uh, one hour. We we can uh, call it. <laughs> I think. <laughs> All right. So okay. Thank you guys for your time. So where can we reach you online, Woody? What about you? Uh, you guys can find me at at the Wooden Chef on Instagram 
that's the best place to find me. I've been eating a lot of great food lately and posting pictures, and I've actually am cooking a dinner here in a few weeks, so I will be making my own stuff to post up there to show y'all. Nice. And also, speaking of restaurants and stuff, you went to Canada recently, and I will find a time so that we can talk about it on the next episode, if you want. Sure. All right. And also, I think you were there when I mentioned it, but I want to do a you know travel-focused episode at some point. And uh, I want you guys there. Yeah. Yeah, I can I can tell you about your hometown. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just in case there's something I'm I don't know about. <laughs> right. <laughs> so yeah, Mike, where can we find you online? <laughs> you can find me. Um I'm not a terribly interesting follow. I know I always don't sell myself very well on this. But on Twitter, I'm Mr. D slash M R D S C L A S S. And on Instagram, I am Pickies with Filters, P I C I E S with Filters, because that's what they are pictures with filters. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Thank you guys again. It was great. I had a great time. I hope you did as well. Of course. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's great talking. I you. love talking with you guys about stuff like this. So awesome. Yeah, me too. And Thank you, everyone, for listening. We will catch you on the next one. Thanks. Mm -hmm.